<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. We have some special guests from New York and the Guggenheim Fellowship here, and we need to recite for them our inspiring mantra, our catechism, so that we can inspire ourselves for the conversation that is to come. Ladies and gentlemen, the National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful, that was so inspiring. <laughs> and we are right to set the stage for a great conversation because this is a thrilling uh, convocation that we're about to have. It's the 10th anniversary of the Guggenheim Foundation's Constitutional Fellowship Program. And we've assembled three Guggenheim Constitutional Fellows all of whom are among the most distinguished scholars in America of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolished slavery. And as you know, the, this year, is the, on July 9th, is the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed equality. So there's no better group and no better time to think about the constitutional legacy of the Reconstruction Era amendments and their contemporary meaning. I can't wait to begin our conversation. I just need to put in a plug for two upcoming programs. Next Tuesday, Lawrence Tribe will be here to discuss his new book about impeachment on a nonpartisan basis. <laughs> and then on June 21st, uh, Ben Rhodes, the former Deputy National Security Advisor for President Obama, will be here to talk about the Obama presidency. It's now my great pleasure to introduce I just want to make sure he's here because I didn't see him backstage. Is uh, Ed, Edward Hirsch? That is, uh, you are here. Wonderful. Okay. So it's a great honor to introduce the president of the Guggenheim Foundation. Edward Hirsch is one of America's most distinguished poets and critics. He has published nine books of poems, including Wild Gratitude, which won the National Book Critic Award. His nonfiction books include the bestseller How to Read a Poem and Fall in Love with Poetry. And he uh, has also uh, received a MacArthur Fellowship, the Prix de Rome, and a Guggenheim Fellowship for Poetry in 1985. He's been a trustee of the Guggenheim Foundation and became the fourth president of the foundation in 2003. Please join me in welcoming, for welcoming remarks, Edward Hirsch. I feel terrible that I don't have a call and response mantra for you. <laughs> <laughs> the Google I'll have to work on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. It's an honor to be here. Thank you to Jeffrey um, for the opportunity to collaborate with the center on this program. Uh, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation was founded in 1925 by Senator Guggenheim and his wife Olga in memory of their son who died young. The foundation's had a singular purpose ever since, to identify and give fellowships to the very best artists, scholars, and scientists, to free people to do the work that they were meant to do. To me, it's an Emersonian commitment, an American ideal. In Self-Reliance, Emerson says, do your work and I shall know you. Do your work and you shall reinforce yourself. Or as William James once put it, the practical consequences of such a philosophy is the well-known democratic respect for the sacredness of individuality. Since 1925, there have been 18,000 fellows in all scholarly fields and all the arts, including 125 or so future Nobel Prize winners. We've been appointing fellows in law since 1936, and these fellows have included many notable scholars. Tonight's program marks the 10th anniversary of the Guggenheim Fellowship in Constitutional Studies. The fellowship is focused specific, specifically on the, pro, on the process and the study of constitutions, ours and others, the necessity of constitution making rather than more broadly on law. It seems to me that this mandate to constitutional studies is more important than ever in these troubled times. There actually have been 11 fellows since the foundation appointed two fellows in 2008 to start the fellowship off with a bang. 
Three of them are our panelists tonight. Our fellowship in constitutional studies is the brainchild of Dorothy Tapper Goldman, who's a trustee both of the Guggenheim Foundation and the Supreme Court Historical Society. Dorothy's passion for the Constitution is matched only by her generosity, particularly to those who advance our understanding. She is president of her own foundation. She recognizes the Constitution is the bedrock document of democracy everywhere. She's doing her part to sustain constitutional studies. It's an honor for all of us to be with you tonight to talk about a topic so crucial to our democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much for those inspiring remarks. It is now my honor to introduce three of the Guggenheim Constitutional Fellows. They know and admire each other's work, but they had not convened before and not since Jefferson dined alone, et cetera, uh, when it comes to the conversation we're about to have. Uh, Holly Brewer is the Burke Chair of American History and Associate Professor at the University of Maryland. Risa Galyubov is the 12th Dean of the University of Virginia Law School and the first female dean. And Lisa Vanderveld is the Josephine Witt Chair at the University of Iowa College of Law. Please join me in welcoming our very distinguished panelists. Wonderful, it's just synchronicity that each of you has written about the 13th Amendment from different and important perspectives and you've done so in sequence to a degree. Holly, we're going to begin with you because your work uh, is a first in time. You have pathbreaking work about John Locke and the framers understanding of slavery and you found a notation by Locke in the margins of a 1699 report on slavery and land grants in colonial Virginia. Locke wrote, well done in the margin and that approbation led you to a series of insights about Locke's conception of slavery being rooted in British notions of hierarchy, uh, which transformed our understanding of slavery and also of the 13th Amendment. Tell us about the significance of well done and what light it casts on the 13th Amendment. So actually the origins were slightly different. I didn't find that was, I discovered the words well done towards the end of a long project, but I was working on the origins of slavery in Virginia and one of the things I realized is that the only way you could get land in Virginia in the restoration period is if you bought a slave or an indentured servant. And then by royal proclamation, by the king's proclamation, you would be given 50 acres of land. Think about it. This was part of a general overall steward policy to support slavery and, in, and bound labor and large estates because those kinds of estates uh, produce surplus crops that could be then shipped to England and heavily taxed and they became an, a crucial source of crown revenue. And when John Locke was on the Board of Trade in the 1690s after the Glorious Revolution when one of those kings had lost his throne, uh, under the new king he set about trying to reverse that policy that rewarded people with land if they bought a slave. And he wrote new instructions to a governor, had got a new governor appointed with with specific instructions to get rid of that, which he did so, his name was Governor Nicholson, by court decision. And then when the report came back to England, the Board of Trade had oversight of a colonial policy and John Locke was leading it at that point. And when the report came back that the 50 acre land grant for importing Negroes had been gotten rid of, which was slaves, he wrote in the margins, well done. Hmm. So I traced the whole process of that through all the original records. And why this is important is there's been a big debate um, for the last, oh, I mean, a long time about what the Enlightenment has to say about slavery. And John Locke is, of course, a crucial figure of the Enlightenment and very influential on the Declaration and other documents. And people have said, well, actually, John Locke supported slavery, even though it seems like his main writings are opposed to it. They point to evidence that he owned shares in a slave trading company and that he authored an earlier text and I show that the earlier text, he was basically a secretary or a lawyer, not writing, not, it wasn't done for him, by him, um, and that the shares in the Royal African Company he was paid for for earlier service and he sold them in 1675. And instead I argue that his ideas 
in his two treatises of government, the influence or declaration of independence, were actually formed in counterpoint to what the Stuarts were doing with slavery, mm. and that he was actually pretty strongly anti-slavery, and um, that the only way he justified slavery was as punishment for a crime, which is exactly what the 13th Amendment says. The 13th Amendment bans forced labor except as punishment for a crime, and it's virtually word for word what's in Locke. And people who wow. look at those passages have been misreading them because they've been trying to rationalize this earlier evidence with the later and not understanding what he did in the 1690s. And, and uh, did the framers of the 13th Amendment read Locke? Of course they did, and so did, I mean, there are actually versions of this kind of approach as well earlier on. So for example, in 1783, Thomas Jefferson wrote an original draft of the, what was then called the Western Ordinance. So we, it became the Northwest Ordinance, but at first it was the Western Ordinance for all the land in the West. And it also banned slavery except as punishment for a crime. And it failed only by a single vote. Jefferson thought he had the votes in the Continental Congress, but one guy from New Jersey was sick failed by one vote, and as he wrote to um, the editors of the encyclopedia, and when he was in France and they were writing about it, he said, at that fateful moment, God was silent. The fate of millions unborn rested on essentially one guy being sick. Oh my goodness. So there are ways in which this has been a long running conversation that we haven't understood because we've, I think, seen the earlier period much more simplistically. Uh, superb, thank you so much for that. Uh, Lisa Vanderveld, you, uh, Lee. Uh, Lee, uh, you are the, uh, uh, I need my constitutional reading glasses to <laughs> get it right. Um, you're the author of many important books, including Mrs. Dred Scott, A Life on Slavery's Frontier. Uh, the Dred Scott case, of course, uh, if it didn't precipitate the Civil War, helped to galvanize the uh, movements that led to it. And uh, Dred Scott was overturned both by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. I, we must, I must ask you about the case of Mrs. Dred Scott. What role did she have in the case itself, and what connection did she have to the 13th Amendment? That's a wonderful question. The, uh, the connection that she has to the Dred Scott case is that it's actually more her case than it's her husband's. She files suit the same day that he files suit, and her case gets lost because she's a wife. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even recorded a few times in uh, the judicial day book until the judge went back at the end of the year and realized he dropped a case and there it was hers. The reason that her case is as important as it is is that the Dred Scott case doesn't make a lot of sense once it gets to the Supreme Court and you read that set of facts. The motivations, why didn't he run? He's right across the river from Illinois. He had been outside slave territory. Why did he come back? Well, the answer is because he had a wife and two daughters who were turning the age when they would be sold away from the family. The oldest was seven, the year that someone can be sold away from the family. Dredd was aged, he was tubercular, and he almost didn't survive the lawsuit, but the value were the daughters who would come of age and have long, fruitful years, both bearing more children into slavery and the work that they would do. So the way that slavery worked was through the mother, through Mrs. Dred Scott. The person who had to win, for the family to win, was actually Mrs. Dred Scott. Now what this relates to is that when we think about different grievances that gave rise to provisions in our Constitution, the Tea Party, for example, we think about grievances and then we think about what the constitutional response was. We rarely think about the constitutional response being the right of a mother to keep her daughters out of slavery. And yet that was the motivation of the Dred Scott case and why Mrs. Dred Scott is as important in history as probably any of the framers of the 13th, 14th, or 15th Amendments. Remarkable. Uh, I, I mentioned that we're creating a new gallery of the constitutional legacy of the Civil War and Reconstruction, and we're going to 
be very eager for your advice about telling the story of people like Mrs. Red Scott and other unsung heroes. Risa, you uh, have several important books, uh, uh, but your first one, The Lost Promise of Civil Rights, uh, argues that the economic basis of the 13th Amendment was lost over the course of time, and uh, the 13th Amendment meant different times at different periods, but we've lost a sense of its promise of economic uh, equality. Tell us about the lost promise of the 13th Ma Amendment and why it was lost. So the origins of that story really begin with Lee. Uh, I don't know if you want me to turn it over to her and she can tell them and then I can pick up the story or I can just, okay. Um, so Lee has wonderful work about the origins of the 13th Amendment, um, uh, when it was ratified and the economic uh, understandings of it at the time. And really my work built on uh, Lee's earlier work, both earlier than my work and earlier in time when it happened. And, um, and my work really is about what happens to the 13th Amendment in the 20th century. So uh, Lee argues that inherent in the 13th Amendment was not only, uh, were not only aspirations about racial equality, but also aspirations about economic inequality. And if you think about what was slavery, it was a system that did a whole bunch of different things, right? So it was a system of racial oppression uh, and racial inequality, and it was also a system of labor exploitation. Uh, and the 13th Amendment, and other folks have written it's a system of reproduction, as Mrs. Dred Scott's story tells. So there are lots of different ways to understand it, um, but two of the most fundamental were the, the racial exploitation and the economic exploitation. And those two strands really, um, they're dampened, but they survive. And so my first book is really about the way in which African Americans in the middle of the 20th century, when they were thinking about their grievances and how does one constitutionalize Jim Crow, uh, fights against Jim Crow, right? How does one constitutionalize the harms that African American workers experienced in their lives that were partly about segregation, but were also really about economic inequality, material inequality, is about going to segregated schools, but also schools without books and without school buses and without all of the, the benefits that white schools had. And it was also about having jobs, having access to jobs and having access to equal jobs and, uh, and, and equal ways to uh, have economic opportunity and make money and, and, and have a calling. Uh, and so in, in the 1940s, there's this kind of opening up of what conceptions of civil rights are going to look like. So in the early part of the 20th century, uh, during Jim Crow, at the height of Jim Crow, there were, there were very narrow kind of contract-based ideas of individual rights, and those fall apart with the New Deal. And once those fall apart with the New Deal, people start asking, well, what should civil rights look like, and what does the 13th Amendment mean? And the Justice Department, created uh, a new civil rights section in 1939. There'd never been a civil rights section. This is the precursor to today's Civil Rights Division, which is a massive bureaucratic structure. Uh, so there were just a few people <coughs> in it when it started, and they were looking for ways in the Constitution to respond to complaints that they were receiving from African American agricultural workers, from African American uh, uh, war workers, from African American female domestic workers, and thinking, what is the nature of this claim and how do we respond? And they found the 13th Amendment, and they said, the 13th Amendment protects you from involuntary servitude, except if you've been uh, uh, convicted of a crime, and that means you should have labor rights, the kind of labor rights that Lee discovered in the 19th century. Uh, you should be able to join a union. You should be able to organize. You should be able to strike. You should be able to leave. And I know it sounds crazy that in 1940s America, you couldn't take those things for granted, even though you can't leave, right? So my book starts with a group of African-American teenagers in the South who get lured to Florida to pick sugar cane during World War II, and they're virtually enslaved. And they complain to the Justice Department about their their enslavement, and the Justice Department says, this is a violation of the 13th Amendment, but not just this, not just actual enslavement, but the flip side of actual enslavement being labor freedom and material equality, and so the Justice Department has a whole series of cases during the 1940s where they're trying to refine the kinds of conceptions of economic inequality um, uh, uh, in the 13th Amendment. What's uh, remarkable about all of your work is you have resurrected forgotten histories based on uh, individual stories and ideas which turn out to be surprisingly relevant to today. Let's take one more round on the history. And 
Holly, t t tell us about the, 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 the steward or hierarchical conception that supported slavery, which uh, created different categories, not only on the basis of race, but also of social class. Mm -hmm. How that transformed our understanding of slavery and, and perhaps what its contemporary relevance might be. Well, I think it's fair to say that Although England had an unwritten constitution in the 17th century, it did have a certain sense of what the normal war rules were, but rights themselves were pretty limited for everybody. In fact, the basic understanding was that people lacked rights unless they were guaranteed them by charter, and that could come from a colonial charter, or it could come from, say, the city of London, but in the absence of rights, you were assumed not to have them. And so who was a subject became really crucial for establishing some basic rights. And one of the ways that slavery became justified early on was on the grounds that um, people who were infidels or not Christians could not swear an oath of allegiance to the king and therefore were not, did not have the rights of subjects and therefore were aliens. So in fact, sometimes when I hear modern debates about who's an alien and what their rights are, I'm actually, I actually get goosebumps on my arms because I'm reading all these debates in the 17th century yeah where the fact that they're aliens leads to this idea that they're not protected by the laws, and if they're not protected by the laws, then there's quite dramatic leads to, first they have the status of villains, which is medieval serfs, and then they have the status of property. And so you can see this sequence of logic happening for people who are outside these protections. But I would argue that in a very basic way, our modern notions of people having a set of universal rights, quite even outside of the status of subjects or citizens, as we would say, actually have their origins in debates about slavery in the 17th century, so that it's in the context with the Stuarts' hierarchical ideas, which are about the powers of nobles and kings, as well as about the powers of slaves, that you get the emergence of ideas of all men are created equal, that they're endowed with certain basic rights, which we see embodied in the Constitution. Those don't win completely in the 17th century, although there's two revolutions in the 17th century in England that have impacts across the empire where they're partly put into play. The revolution, the American Revolution, carries those ideas much further, as does in some ways the Constitution. But I want to just pause here and say that it's really important to notice, to note even with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, how much those are debated. So, there's been a tendency to say recently that the American Constitution is in some ways a slaveholder's constitution. That The Declaration of Independence, when it wrote all men, it said all men are created equal, didn't mean to include African men. But if you look at the records, you can see that actually um, the Declaration of Independence, first of all, in its original draft, um, coming out of the committee, absolutely meant to include all men because there were three clauses that were part of it. We call them the deleted clauses which blamed the King of England for supporting slavery. And in those comments, in those clauses, um, which had very strong language opposing slavery, um, the word men, when it referred to Africans, was both in italics and capital letters. Um, the only other place you see that in the Declaration drafts is in the actual United States of America in the title. And uh, those words, those three paragraphs, were only taken out on the insistence of Edward Rutledge of South Carolina who basically did the same thing that his brother would do 11 years later in the Constitutional Convention and said, South Carolina won't be part of this union if you don't remove those clauses. Mm. And the others gave in. So you could actually see that vote on July 1st. And in the Constitution, there are four places where slavery is protected, but it's never protected by name. So I won't go through all of them, but one, just quickly, is to keep the slave trade for an additional 20 years and that, that it can't be outlawed in the U.S. until 20, more, 20 years later, which we all know about. And it happens on the first day it can happen when Jefferson, Jefferson is president in 1808. But um, it's not a slaveholder's constitution. I mean, it protects slavery in some ways, and that's important to understand, but it doesn't protect slavery nearly as much as it could. Mm. And so it's, it's in the compromises, it's in the debate, we can understand the power of it, I guess I would say. Um, and that there's many ways in which the Constitution is a firm, um, makes the firmest argument we have about human rights that had existed at anywhere at that point in, in time. So we need to pay attention to that part of it as well and to the debate. Remarkable story and we'll 
look at the Rutledges in Signers Hall in a new light after that <laughs> account. Uh, Lee, uh, uh, Risa referred to the incredibly rich history of the Reconstruction Amendments that you've laid out and the economic basis for it that you have illuminated. Give us a sense of what the, what the framers of the 13th Amendment were trying to achieve and whether that promise uh, was achieved or thwarted. You know, it's remarkable how rich the Reconstruction Congress debates are. These are folks who, who's, who stylistically can, can match Dickens. The uh, language, the uh, aspiration, uh, the reach of their language and their imaginations is, is really quite remarkable. I came across a passage that I wanted to share because I don't know that it's been utilized very often. And it's during the course of these debates and the 13th Amendment is being adopted, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act, the Freedmen's Bureau Acts. And at one point, a representative from Kentucky says, if this isn't a revolution, I don't know what is. And when you think about that, you realize how deep, and, and this fellow wasn't even a radical, re, re, radical Republican, so he was, he was uh, just part of the folks who were voting along with everyone else for the changes. But the whole idea that the Constitution would no longer just be a constitution of federalism, but it would be a constitution of individual rights is re really quite remarkable. My colleague Jim Pova said that the 13th Amendment is one of the few amendments that actually places an affirmative duty on the government to make sure that involuntary servitude does not exist. Nowhere else in the Constitution is there that kind of affirmative obligation. Now, as the individuals are debating, there's this continual tension with how are they going to imagine a new republic free of slavery, not just abolishing slavery as an institution, but abolishing all of the effects that the decades of slavery had allowed to grow up in the South with a class above and a class below. What the radical Republicans of the Reconstruction believed is that everyone really was equal to advance their lives as far as they wanted to take them and that there should be no overbearing power anywhere. That's really quite remarkable. The 14th Amendment is the first time that we get the word equal protection in the Constitution. Before, we know that all men are created equal, but what does that mean if there's no protection that goes along with the statement of equality? We get suffrage, and we get suffrage in the 15th Amendment, but unfortunately not for people like Harriet Scott, because women do not get the right to vote, only men it would take more decades before Harriet's daughters would get the right to vote. Still, suffrage was a huge battleground. Now I have to mention just one more thing with the current conversation about impeachment, but there's no doubt that all of the energy and effort that went into the attempt at impeachment of Andrew Johnson, an impeachment that failed by one vote, one vote, meant that the reform momentum, that the momentum that they had gotten going in order to really make the United States the republic of the promise that the original Constitution had hoped for, got deadlocked. It got stopped. Now, Johnson doesn't get reelected. He has still some political career, which is kind of surprising. He gets reelected to Congress. And the very folks who wanted to impeach him have to swear him in as a congressman. <laughs> Nonetheless, impeachment is such a high bar that if Andrew Johnson couldn't get impeached, it's a high bar. 
at, we're certainly learning of the power of one vote in this remarkable <laughs> uh, conversation. Risa, why did the economic promise of the 13th Amendment drop out over the course of the 20th century, and what might the 13th Amendment mean if it were resurrected? So I think uh, the story is it's a complicated one, and there are many causes, and I think most of us historians sitting up here say it's always multi-causal, right? There's not a single one. But uh, you know, the story that most of us know about the road to Brown, right, the NAACP moving inexorably forward toward 1954, is a lot more complicated than that. And in the 1940s, when the Department of Justice is doing these involuntary servitude cases and really exploring what the 13th Amendment is going to mean, at the same time, the NAACP is exploring what the 14th Amendment is going to mean. Uh, and they are moving along parallel paths. They're interacting at certain moments. But there are really so many questions. It was not the case that it was clear that the NAACP was going to bring a case to the Supreme Court in education, that the real issue, that the constitutional framework would be the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, that the idea would be that segregation separate and apart from material inequality would be the nature of the claim, uh, that it would be a claim against government as opposed to against private individuals. And if you think back to the, the point that Lee just made about Jim Pope, um, the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment both have the language, no state shall do the various things. And that comes to be called the state action requirement. And as Lee was saying, the 13th Amendment doesn't have a state action requirement. It's an affirmative requirement on government. Uh, and because the NAACP was ultimately moving toward the 14th Amendment and ultimately moving toward the Equal Protection Clause, it found itself focused far more on state action, right? So then schools become the obvious, one of the more obvious targets because employment, well, there are thousands of employers, millions of employers, they're all private. Uh, corporations or private citizens, so how do you make constitutional claims against them if you're making claims under the Equal Protection Clause that has a state action requirement? Um, but eventually, the NAACP, for lots of good reasons, I don't mean this in a bad way, they were excellent lawyers and they were making uh, excellent strategic, constitutional, doctrinal, institutional judgments that led them to the, to the, to the, to the place where they were making an equal protection claim under the 14th Amendment about segregation. And one of the most important parts of that, I think, is um, that they really wanted to undermine the 1896 case of Plessy versus Ferguson. And Plessy versus Ferguson was a case about um, uh, the segregation uh, uh, of transportation. And the idea in that case, and, and what the majority opinion basically says is, if, we, if a state segregates blacks and whites, and, and, and African Americans feel badly about it, it's their problem. They don't have to feel badly about it. Separation isn't in and of itself something that puts a black mark of inferiority upon a particular race. If they feel that way, it's because they feel that way. And the NAACP really wanted to say, no, you know, the whole point of segregation is to denigrate African Americans. The whole point of it is to exclude and oppress and exploit and, and, uh, and denigrate. And, uh, and so they made every effort in Brown and the companion cases to say, set aside the material inequalities. Let's assume they have equal books. Let's assume they have equal uh, uh, buses. Let's assume all the, all the material economic issues are equalized. There's still a problem. And they're absolutely right about that. There's still a problem. And it's a constitutional problem. It's the problem that Brown identifies. But what you lose by saying that is, you've set aside all the economic questions. You've said, let's not talk about those. Let's talk about segregation. And I, I think Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP lawyers really thought, if you tackled segregation and if you undermined segregation, the economic equality would come. And it would follow that. And it hasn't. And it turns out it doesn't, right? And it turns out that Jim Crow was so much about economic inequality, uh, equal to, in my view, it being about segregation and state-imposed separation. Uh, and because of the path that ultimately got taken, the 13th Amendment falls away, 
the economic inequality claims fall away. And it has led to, I think, a place where it's very hard to see how to make constitutional claims about economic inequality. We have a sense that the Equal Protection Clause really doesn't get to it, uh, and that the 13th Amendment also doesn't really get to it. And, uh, and so part of my work has been trying to show that we have resources, we have historical resources, both going back to the founding of the amendments and also much more recent, um, where lawyers are identifying how one can interpret the Constitution so that it does speak uh, to economic questions and to questions of material inequality. It's interesting how the uh, economics has come through all of what we've said from mm -hmm. Holly talking about how with slavery you get land mm -hmm. to the uh, final uh, compromise that gets done in the civil rights um, litigation. But it, as, as we look at this, even at the 13th Amendment time, they're debating an eight hour maximum hour day, eight hours. Now, we don't even get a state legislature with a 10 hour day until Lochner, which is into the 20th century, a 10 hour day. And they were suggesting that an eight hour day yeah. was the appropriate amount of time for people to work and they actually uh, discuss this as if you only work eight hours, well then you are able to be independent. And they uh, thought about this very seriously because it would create a level of autonomy which would permit the working people to participate fully in the republic that was being sought. But that economic base was there from the origins through the middle of the 20th century to where we are now. This is absolutely fascinating. There is a renewed appreciation of the economic basis of the Constitution, which your work has contributed to. We had a great event with Juresh uh, uh, Sitiyaraman recently about his book, The Middle Class Constitution, which talks how central economic equality was to Madison's thinking when he looked mm -hmm. forward to the year 1930 and feared that economic inequality would make impossible the equality of conditions on which the Constitution relied. If, I know that presentism is a danger among historians, but it's a requirement among lawyers. <laughs> uh, it's what we do all the time. So if the economic foundations of the 13th Amendment were resurrected, what kind of arguments might one make today? And I'll just add, as you think about that, the Supreme Court recently cited the 13th Amendment to justify the Matthew Shepard Hate Crime Act. The 13th Amendment, as uh, Risa said, doesn't have a state action requirement. The Hate Crimes Act forbids private action uh, involving hate crimes, and uh, the Supreme Court said the 13th Amendment authorized it, but if you, if you feel like playing this, this game. I guess what, the what, only what, way what, what, what I would like to play with it is by thinking about illegal aliens mm -hmm. and their status today, and that um, we, there's a lot of ways in which the very fact of being illegal means that you've committed a crime, which invokes the 13th Amendment clause about no slavery, no involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime, which is now being used to essentially imprison people who are illegal aliens for nothing, no other reason. And people are being arrested sometimes when they go to courtrooms to complain about something. So you can't complain about how you're treated on a job now because if you show up at courtroom, you'll be arrested by ICE. And um, in fact, silencing people in the law, making them legally silent so they can't testify in a court of law was one of the elements of slavery that I call a bundle of lost rights. <coughs> so I guess what's scary for me is watching how this clause, which is meant to mostly eliminate slavery, except for a very serious crime, is now being used in the context of the illegal alien debates to, in fact, deny a whole bunch of rights related to labor. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, Leah, do you, do you have a current uh, a series of arguments that might be made in neo-originalist terms if the 13th Amendment's economic basis were taken seriously? Uh, I, I shy away from originalist as a, uh, uh, as, a, um, as a descriptor, but I do think, as, as uh, Risa has said, there are these historical resources that we can bring to bear, and we could bring these historical resources to bear in changing minds and in legal cases. 
one of the problems with the 13th Amendment is that it has long played defense. It's very difficult to bring an affirmative case to assert an affirmative right, which is what an economic right would be. Instead, it's a protector and it plays defense against someone who has taken an enslaving or an involuntary control of another human being. What I'd like to see is I'd like to see class actions brought back. However, <laughs> reading the Supreme Court decision <laughs> uh, 10 days ago, I don't see that happening soon. It would almost need to be a class action that would assert an economic right, and it needed as the uh, care with which the civil rights lawyers chose their cases, so too care would have to be done in picking the right cases at the right time to advance a larger understanding of the rights that Americans should be entitled to. If they're willing to work, they should have meaningful work. If they're willing to work, they should have work that allows them to support themselves and their families. Those are all part of what the Reconstruction Congress was discussing as the ideal, as the objective. Fascinating. Uh, Risa, we need to put in a plug for your second book, which is the one that you wrote with your <laughs> Guggenheim Constitutional Fellowship, which was Vagrant Nation, Police Power, Constitutional Change and the Makings of the 1960s. Tell us about that and in the 1960s, as we were discussing, uh, arguments about equal protection and due process were more frequently made together and the court was less shy about connecting the economic and the liberty rights. So if that fundamental right strand of equal protection were resurrected today, what might result? So one thing I'll note to bring it back into the, the 13th Amendment conversation is that uh, the book is largely about these uh, this regime of vagrancy laws that um, came to the United States uh, from England with the colonists. They made it a crime to be idle and poor, to be dissolute or immoral or lewd or wander about with no apparent purpose. As you can see, they were very broad and they were used against anyone who didn't fit in or seemed out of place in any way. And uh, in the 1960s, so for 400 years, these laws are used ubiquitously and they're, they're turned, um, they're very low level laws and they're fairly invisible and so they get turned to any new threat that comes about. Uh, they're used against workers, they're used against communists, they're used against beatniks and hippies and civil rights protesters and Vietnam War protesters. I mean, whoever the new threat is, these, these laws were turned against them. Uh, and in the 1960s, pretty much every one of the social movements that occurs in the 1960s is regulated by vagrancy laws and begins to challenge them. And one of the claims that is made against vagrancy laws is that it's a viol they're a violation of the 13th Amendment's prohibition on involuntary servitude mm -hmm. because they essentially make it a crime to choose not to work. Uh, so Lee chose her language very carefully if you choose to work, right? And, uh, and if you chose not to work or if in our Keynesian economic structure, you are surplus labor, which is built into the structure, uh, you, you were suddenly criminalized for, uh, for being idle and not being able to support yourself. And that had always been the case. And in the 1960s, that starts to look a little suspect, both because people are choosing a different kind of relationship to the economy and because the economy presumes some level of unemployment. So if you are the sacrificial non-worker, how can it be that you are also a criminal? Um, but to, to answer your question, one of, the, um, one of the fascinating things that I learned in writing Vagrant Nation was that you know, we lawyers, and I think uh, often as a result, we historians tend to think, we legal historians tend to think in, you know, doctrinal categories and constitutional categories. So uh, there are the 13th Amendment categories and the, the equal protection cases and the due process cases. And one of the things that became clear in the writing of Vagrant Nation was that, you know, uh, uh, to go back to something Lee said earlier, People experience a harm and they come to their lawyer and they say, I've had this harm, I've been arrested for vagrancy just for being me, that can't possibly be right. And the lawyers try to figure out all of the possible constitutional responses that they can make, all of the possible constitutional claims. And they're not focused just on one or the other. And then in particular, um, one of the things that, that becomes so clear is that 
they are holding in their hands at the same time, and the court, the Supreme Court is thinking about this at the same time, the relationship between being a certain kind of person and engaging in certain kind of behavior. So in the late 1960s, there are a whole bunch of cases where hippies are coming forward and saying, we have a right to have long hair, or we have a right to live in a commune, and all these kinds of things. And the court is saying, well, do you have that right because you're a hippie, and a hippie is a kind of unpopular minority, and you have an equal protection right as a group? Or do you have that right because you have some kind of substantive due process right, a fundamental right under the 14th Amendment to due process clause, like abortion, or like the right to uh, contraception, where you get to choose your own lifestyle, you get to choose what you do with your body. And these two things that today seem very far apart uh, were really thought of together as alternatives that lawyers and judges were, were trying to think about. And um, you know, Justice Kennedy has recently brought them together in uh, the same-sex marriage cases in Obergefell and Windsor, but in ways that I think reveal that, that we don't know this history, that we don't know that they used to be combined and they can be recombined again uh, with these resources from the past, not necessarily all the way back to 1787 or 1789 or even to you know, 1868, but, um, but to, to more recent times when lawyers were really creatively trying to problem solve around these questions. Can I just have one yes, sentence on that? I just wanted to say that those vagrancy laws had the, were actually aimed against the poor mm -hmm. in the 17th century, and that they were part of a whole structure of laws where poor, the poor, poor people had many fewer privileges, and then if you were a free man, you had a few more, mm -hmm. and you made a certain amount, and the, with nobility and monarchs at the top. And we like to think of America as being separate mm -hmm. from that whole entire hierarchical structure, but in fact, it was not. And that's what happens in the 60s is everybody says, oh my God, how is it possible we're sti still living with certain laws from 17th century England that are so completely out of place in you know, modern American life? I can't help but ask these questions, they're spectacular, but should Douglas have used the 13th Amendment in the Papa Christie decision rather than the sort of freedom to loaf substantive due process stuff? So it's interesting, he doesn't even actually use the freedom of loaf substantive due process because it gets written, I mean, it's still there, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a great question and a longer answer than we have time for, but I'll say just very briefly, um, he nods to it. And one of the fascinating parts of the vagrancy law story is that in Douglas's opinion, so he writes this opinion in 1972 called Proper Christi v. City of Jacksonville, and um, there are eight defendants in that case. Four of them are two white women and two African-American men who are out on the town in Jacksonville, Florida in 1969, and they get arrested for vagrancy by prowling by auto, which is not in the, the law. Uh, <laughs> the law has 18 different ways you can be a vagrant, and that is not one of them. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and this is two years after Loving versus Virginia had said anti-miscegenation laws were not constitutional. Um, and so this case comes up and Douglas really writes this kind of pie into the 60s and it incorporates hippies and, uh, and African Americans and poor people and sexual nonconformists. And I mean, and he, he really incorporates it all and it's the opinion that he wanted read at his funeral Wow. Uh, it was, he was so attached to this. That was the one. He was on the bench for 37 years. That was the opinion uh, that he wanted read at his funeral. And um, the basis could have actually been any number of things. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and I actually like the fact it, it ends up being void for vagueness. The law is just too, void, too vague for anyone to really know either how to conform to it or for police officers to even know how to enforce it. Um, and, uh, but, but when you read the opinion, you can see the whole history of the vagrancy law challenge. You can see all the different groups and you can see all the different claims. And so the 13th Amendment is in there, uh, mm. not in so many words, but, but it's all there. And I, I don't actually think the, the opinion would have been better if it had focused on just one, mm -hmm. because the point of the challenge was the vagrancy laws do all of this. Uh, and that's what makes them so insidious and so dangerous and so controlling is that under the, under the, the, the visibility, uh, there, there are these laws that just keep on chugging for hundreds and hundreds of years and, uh, and nobody knows about them and yet they affect so many different kinds of people's lives. Wow. All right, we have superb questions from the audience uh, and this first one is very resonant and specific. What is it about South Carolina? <laughs> First, <laughs> refusing to sign the Declaration of Independence if those words were included. Second, threatening to walk out of the Constitutional Convention. Third, the first state to secede in 1861. 
why were none of the other southern states quite as radical? Uh, Holly, I think that's for you. Yeah, that's for me. And, uh, <laughs> it actually has a pretty straightforward answer. South Carolina was the only state with a black majority in um, 1776. And because of the nature of the way slaves were turned into property under the English common law, and it was done by high courts in England, slaves became the most important form of collateral for debt by the American Revolution. So about 70% of enslaved people in America in 1776 were collateral for extensive debts owed mostly to British merchants. And the terms of the Treaty of Paris in 1783 that ended the revolution honored that debt and enforced it. And the South Carolinians were the main people um, throughout to have then therefore the, the collateral, which was against the debt. They owed the debt in regard, does, uh, so in other words, it, it was a really important economic consideration which was behind it in the South. Um, it was harder for more people in South Carolina to envision a world without mm. slaves than it was for most elsewhere. In fact, amazingly, at the Constitutional Convention, all the Virginia delegates were opponents of slavery. Wow. So, um, and then of course in the Civil War, it's the same. Yeah, it is, it is South Carolina. I mean, it's other places as well, but they, it's a bigger deal. I mean, I just want to say super quickly, um, our, slavery was legal in every state in 1776, in every colony coming out of the British Empire. And the colonies that we, the states that we come to call the North were defined by setting up gradual abolition laws to get rid of slavery or doing it by court decision. And even in many of the southern states, there were, de there were debates over such bills, such as in Virginia in 1796, where a bill for gradual abolition of slavery got 40% of the vote in the lower house. In so Virginia. In Virginia yeah. in 1796. So this wasn't like, um, it, was, it was terribly debated. There was a lot of movement but the places that were slavery was the most embedded, which was South Carolina, where actually you got 100 acres if you bought a slave originally by the proprietor's note. So in other words, you bought a slave, if you bought a slave in South Carolina in the year 1670, you were given 100 acres by the proprietors. It was the most hierarchical, the largest estates along the seaboard, and the most slaves. Completely fascinating, a consequence of local property laws in some ways. Well, this next question is directly related to your observation about the Virginians voting against uh, slavery, and that's how could persons of wealth be expected to give up slavery when their wealth was based on slavery and slave ownership? Lee, do you want to take a stab at that? What, were they motivated by Enlightenment uh, ideals, or what, why were they voting against their interests? Um, at least in the period of the 13th Amendment and Reconstruction, the, uh, the first step in manumission emancipation was actually to emancipate the slaves in the District of Columbia. And the slaves in the District of Columbia were only emancipated with compensation. Now there's a, a, a dichotomous relationship to this because the abolitionists are saying, you're making a deal with the devil, you're paying someone off you're actually buying the slave in order to free them. There, were, there was in the Constitution some concern that if you emancipated all the slaves, you might violate the taking of property without just compensation. So it was a tiny step in the direction of creating the atmosphere of the District of Columbia, where after all, the Constitution was being revised to be a free area. After that, I think that the, um, the folks who are in the Reconstruction Congress are not slave holders for the most part. The South has seceded. The South has called back its delegates. The slave holders who would be the delegates from the South, they're not at the table. And if they're not at the table, they're not there to defend their interests. So it's less that slaveholders decided to act against their interests than the fact that by selectively secreting themselves from Congress, 
removing themselves from Congress, they were no longer part of the discourse. Can I just say two sentences? Please, more. And what at about the, those Virginians? At too? the time yeah. of the, um, when Jefferson heard the news about the Treaty of Paris that said that the debts to British merchants had to be repaid with interest over the course of the war, and that most of the, he knew, as well as everybody did, that many of those debts, most of those debts were secured by slaves, and that many slaves had run away during the war. It's a long story, but he was absolutely furious, as were many others, because one of the things that effectively did was bind people's hands in terms of their ability to free slaves, because you couldn't free slaves if you had debts any more than I could give somebody my house if it's mortgaged to the bank. And I, could, I can just, yeah. I can elaborate on that, but I think you kind of get the picture about, I think there was actually a moment if the terms of the Treaty of Paris had been different where you actually could have made a much bigger step towards abolishing slavery completely hmm. in the United States. That's Interesting. amazing. Interesting. Yeah, just because just it's so resonant, the, the, the Virginians, those 40%, were they Lockeans? Is that why they voted against it? Or their economic interests just weren't as engaged? I, would, I think it's fair to say they believed in the principles of all men are created equal under the law and that you shouldn't be born to a status, which is what slavery was. Well, we have so many great questions, but just basically uh, time for, I think, Riza to answer them. So I'm going to give you several, and you can choose which, uh, okay. which one to do. Uh, uh, th th first, what's your opinion of the documentary film 13, if you've seen it? Uh, second is about reparations. To what degree, extent do you believe reparations could address these historical wrongs committed against African Americans, and what would Af re uh, reparations look like? And then if none of those appeal, uh, <laughs> Do, do, what do you think of the current method of school funding uh, taxes for schools, which is local and simply perpetuates glaring inequalities? Uh, would, uh, sh does the, should the, should, was the Supreme Court wrong not to require equality of funding? So there's are three great uh, questions, and you can pick anyone you like. They're excellent questions, and we're out of time. No. <laughs> 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 they, they are great questions. So I, I will, I, I'm going to take a version of the last one, uh, but it'll, it'll link to the, the second one as well, I think, to some extent. So um, I teach a class, uh, among the classes that I teach, I teach a class called Constitutional Law to Poverty. And it's, uh, it's, it's a doctrinal class about the way the Constitution addresses questions of poverty and the rights of poor people and whether they have rights. And it's a doctrinal class, but it's also a historical class because there was really only one moment in, uh, in modern constitutional history where the court played with that in a, in a serious way, to mix the metaphor a little bit, and that was in the 1960s. And it really ends in 1973 with the case of San Antonio v. Rodriguez, which is the case where um, a claim was made that the 14th Amendment required more even school funding uh, than local property tax-based uh, funding would be. And, and that case is a, is a Burger Court case. Warren Burger is the Chief Justice in 1973, appointed by Richard Nixon. The Burger Court follows the notoriously or famously, depending on your politics, uh, liberal Warren Court uh, of the 1950s and the 1960s. And it was the Warren Court that had, uh, in a similar way to what I was talking about, about vagrancy laws, the Warren Court had said, gosh, <laughs> There's got to be some way to respond to economic inequality, and this is, in a way, the the, the what happens to the Thirteenth Amendment later. Um, so it really brings us back around, and and they they ask questions about procedural due process, the Thirteenth Amendment, substantive due process, uh, equal protection, right? They're, they they attack it from all kinds of angles, and they begin the process of creating a doctrinal basis for many of those, and then the politics shift and the election of 1968 and Richard Nixon, and he gets a whole bunch, gets four uh, appointments to the Supreme Court right off the bat, and uh, San Antonio v. Rodriguez comes up, and it actually gets delayed for a while, uh, and, I, and my husband has written about this, and, and he has written that if it had actually gotten decided when it was first up at the court, it likely would have gone the other way. Wow. Um, uh, and by 1973, the Nixon appointees have enough power on the court that um, that the court says no. But one of the things, and this is where I'll stop, and I, I don't really know whether the National Constitution Center engages with this a lot or not, but um, the action in the school funding issues has really been at the state constitutional mm -hmm. level ever since San Antonio v. Rodriguez. And 
Um, and I think it's really important to remember that when we talk about our constitutions, you know, we have the national constitution, which is what most of us historians and, and law professors think about most of the time, um, but the state constitutions play a crucial role. And, uh, and if, especially in these school funding cases, they have really been the place, and New Jersey has really been uh, at the forefront of this, but a number of states have a right to an education in their constitutions, and they have used that rather than some other uh, clause that may or may not speak to this specific issue, they've often used that as a way of, uh, of finding arguments uh, about this issue. Thank you for that. Uh, we have indeed had some great debates about the state constitutional claims that school funding violates state constitutions, including the Bagheera case in California, and you should check all of those out online. I have to say, thank you to Dorothy Goldman for having supported a program which in 10 years has produced three of the most extraordinary scholars of the 13th Amendment who've cast so, so much light on this crucial and underappreciated history, and it is thrilling and a great honor to celebrate the 10th anniversary of this program, and here's to many more. Please join me in thanking our fellows.